thanks to the, uh, the group here. And uh, we better move along quickly. Uh, I know I've only got three hours to present these slides. Uh, let me also start with a disclosure statement. This is as something Mark pointed out. Well, it's, it's an illustration of the progress that's been made in the treatment of lysosomal conditions like mucopolysaccharidosis, mucolipidosis. 31 years ago, uh, there were no pharmaceutical and only modest NIH support. What a, what a huge distance we've come. But I make this disclosure uh, so that you know I um, am paid on occasion, either through the university directly uh, or indirectly or through me uh, directly uh, for some of the work we do. Uh, I'll also talk about off-label, in other words, experimental therapies. Uh, I've changed this, the uh, title slightly of what I was going to talk about to uh, a broader subject. I'd like to put gene therapy. Gene therapy is my main focus of this discussion. I'd like to put it in the context of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about here is the lysosomal disease network. This is part of the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. This is an NIH umbrella organization of now 21 different rare disease clinical trials. The NPS Society itself is the reason all of these orphan disease research networks are funded. It was the NIH that listened, well, I'll put it this way, it was the MPS Society that lobbied their congresspeople, talked to their congressmen face to face, motivated them to put us, get the uh, Congress to pass a law, actually, uh, to put money into a certain kind of research. And that research ultimately came down as a law that NIH implemented, spending, I think it was $37.5 million in that era 15 years ago for research that had to be clinical. It was dealing with patients. Number two, it had to be networked across the U.S. and had to deal with three, in other words, orphan diseases. So orphan diseases, clinical research, uh, networked. So now we're part of that. Thanks to the support of NPS Society in particular, uh, you'll see here the 21 different um, consortia. Uh, you'll see right here, uh, sorry, there we go, the Lysosome Disease Network. You'll see that we have to work by virtue of this funding mechanism at NIH with the coalition of patient advocates like the MPS Society. Most of these 21 independent or separate consortia working on a group of orphan diseases has one patient advocate group. We have almost 40. It's because there are so many lysosomal diseases uh, being supported by uh, various uh, conditions, uh, various uh, patient advocate groups. All of our data becomes uh, part of the uh, public domain information. We all have to submit our data to something called the Data Management and Coordinating Center. So anything we eventually uh, put into a, uh, a database uh, becomes federally available uh, through a unique website. This is the lysosomal diseases. It's not just mucopolysaccharidoses, but by virtue of some common biology, we're learning a lot about them and what we learn in one condition may translate into other uh, conditions. What I'm going to talk about is breakthroughs in lysosomal disease understanding and therapy. And I've divided this concept into various eras. The first the era uh, of discovery, and that is the discovery of cross-correction beginning in about 1960. From that, we derived uh, enzyme replacement therapy, and so we have the era of enzyme replacement therapy that began about 1980, 1981. Third, we more recently developed small molecule therapies, not big enzymes, but small molecules that have a therapeutic impact. And then now that there are different kinds of therapies, we're actually combining uh, uh, different therapies, and that began about in 1998. Uh, as genetic engineering and molecular biology advanced, we've started creating our own enzymes. I call this synthetic enzyme replacement. And currently, we are working on gene therapy, of course. And if you look at the timeline for this, you get a general sense of how things pro are progressing. Some of the old ideas, like just discovering new things, are still an uh, important part of where we go. And so replacement therapy is still uh, part of where we go, but we've advanced it uh, by combining therapies using small molecules. We've also developed synthetic uh, molecules, which are enzymes, and we've been working for a long, long time on gene therapy. So let's first talk about the era of discovery. This began, by and large, um, by Elizabeth Neufeld and colleagues at NIH when they discovered the phenomenon of cross-correction. She had learned that radioactive sulfate would be uh, increasing because it was incorporated into mucopolysaccharides. And if you mix accidentally, in fact, the first, uh, first case of this, Hurler cells in tissue culture with cells from a patient with Hunter syndrome, one corrected the other. Manos and mannose 6-phosphate were recognized 
as key parts of enzyme replacement therapy or the uptake by specific receptors on cells. And then Roscoe Brady actually came here to the University of Minnesota in 1980 and using hexosaminidase purified from human urine administered the first human enzyme to a patient dying of Sandhoff disease, an infant dying of Sandhoff disease. That was the first uh, actual human enzyme replacement therapy in 1980. Um, now, many of you who are following research in mucopolysaccharosis conditions, particularly Hurler syndrome, know that we've been doing bone marrow transplants here for a long time. <clears throat> Elsa Shapiro and I and our group have accumulated IQs, cognitive tests, on patients with Hurler syndrome over many, many years. And this illustrates 174 IQ tests on 137 children with Hurler syndrome before they had any treatment at all. And the key observation here is that if you look at age across the bottom, if you look, for instance, at 0.5 years of age, one year of age, one and a half, two, and you plot these against the IQ, 100 being average IQ, you can create a line here that shows the natural history or the slope of decline in cognition as we measure it uh, by this one particular test. And so for those of you who are mathematically oriented, the slope of this line is 20, which means 20 IQ point drop per year. So that's what we're facing. You know, that'll become relevant to something else I'm gonna talk, to here, talk about here momentarily. So let's talk about the first therapies for an MPS condition. We learned back in, 1990, in the 1980s that bone marrow transplant actually could halt neurodegeneration. And this was first coming out of a publication uh, by Jack Hobbs in London, who did the first bone marrow transplants for Hurler syndrome in London. Subsequently, my colleague and uh, mentor, uh, Bill Crivett, said, well, we can do this in the U.S. Let's try putting normal bone marrow from a sibling into a child with Martolomé syndrome. And this particular uh, young lady was about 16 years of age. She was dying from respiratory problems. They felt she had no um, much, much more than six to 12 months to live. And so it seemed as though the risk of a bone marrow transplant, a risk of 20% of death uh, at that point in time, was justified by her imminent demise. In fact, she survived bone marrow transplant, and now some 30 years later, she just died uh, this, this past fall. Um, and then we took on the bigger challenge. Many people had read Jack Hobbs' publication saying you could prevent the brain disease in Hurler syndrome, but that was only after a year of observation. People were very, very skeptical of his work. And so it was our mission, my assignment as coming on faculty at the University of Minnesota to see was Jack Hobbs right or wrong. And so we transplanted one child, this little girl, Kelly Berger, and then a second and a third and a fourth. And it took us eight to 10 years, eight to 10 years, to be really confident that we had stabilized or prevented neurodegeneration. And we also learned that you had to pick very, very young children uh, where the, the, the potential for saving the brain was still there. Every year, remember, one is using 20 IQ points. And, and by and large, those IQ points, that ability to, to learn is lost as the brain uh, deteriorates. So age becomes very important, and I'll talk about that again here briefly. But we do know then that hematopoietic stem cell is the standard of care now for MPS1 conditions, and virtually every child in the U.S. undergoes uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, either using bone marrow or umbilical cord as a source of stem cells. So that opened up, or concomitantly was occurring, the era of enzyme replacement therapy. And these are the drugs that have gone through FDA or EMA approval in the year in which they were uh, first uh, uh, approved. So you can see back in 1991, Henry Termeer and uh, Roscoe Brady did the first enzyme replacement for Gaucher disease. And then that was enzyme purified from human placenta. Uh, that was concurrent with the age of um, uh, recombinant uh, DNA and uh, molecular biology, genetic engin engineering. So over a very short period of time, they took that concept and they made one of the first, if you will, synthetic enzymes. They put the normal Hurler DNA, or sorry, Gaucher disease enzyme sequence into a uh, plasmid, a piece of DNA, and were able to put that into what are called Chinese hamster ovary cells and make the um, alglucerase enzyme in a factory, uh, much like brewing yeast in some ways, but then purifying them. Thereafter, uh, Bob Desnick and a, a competing company uh, in the U.S. Uh, worked on an enzyme replacement therapy for uh, Fabry disease, alpha-lactosidase, amylcacus, and I got to give credit to Mark Dant, invented, if you will, lironidase, enzyme replacement therapy for MPS-1, 
And then it goes on from there. In 2005, Mara Tolome uh, was a target of enzyme replacement therapy, Hunter syndrome, POMP disease, more Gaucher disease enzymes. We actually have competition in the field now. And then Morchio syndrome, and most recently, Sabellopase alpha for Woma disease in the adult form, which is called cholesterol storage disease. So continuing on, uh, there, are, there are other drugs in development, meaning they're not available by prescription, but they're under FDA review now. An hydrosulfatase for Hunter syndrome that uh, could access the central nervous system more directly. Uh, for San Filippo syndrome, for Sly syndrome, uh, for San Filippo syndrome type B, and Fabry disease and Gaucher disease, and even one for galactosialidosis. So there's still work developing enzymes. Uh, in, in particular, I want to mention briefly an enzyme replacement therapy for San Filippo syndrome because this is an attempt to treat the brain directly with enzyme replacement therapy. It's a way of attempting to get across the blood-brain barrier, in this case, simply by putting a tube in across the blood-brain barrier and seeing if we can get enzyme, if you will, you know, to bathe the brain directly. Uh, Elsa Shapiro and I in our group at University of Minnesota saw 25 patients with San Filippo syndrome type A trying to characterize their natural history. In other words, for each of these 25 children and a few adults, we followed their IQ, did MRIs, did lumbar spinal taps looking for biomarkers, and came up with data which we now call the natural history study. We can see that this is, for example, one piece of information or data. It's the decline in IQ as we measure it, or age equivalency, uh, over age. So look at these 25 patients. We learn a couple things. They're looking at three, actually four uh, measurements. There's this, uh, again, the similar slope to NMPS1. We can also divide sort of an early onset or severe form of San Filippo syndrome shown in black dots to a more later onset or attenuated form of San Filippo syndrome type A. With this kind of data, you can start drawing, drawing graphs like this. This is the same data. Uh, just uh, re, uh, re a little bit. That blue line shows the normal expectation for a person who does not have San Filippo syndrome. The blue and the green and the black lines show what we observed in children that did have San Filippo syndrome type A. Um, so there are still unmet needs. We know that very well. How do we resolve them? Uh, well, so the central nervous system, the brain, is a, a very big concern. How do we get better therapy for more diseases in the brain? How do we approach the skeletal system and connective tissue joint, uh, boy, uh, joints and uh, bones? Well, there's new approaches to think about. Is the dose right? Is the route of administration correct? Do we need to combine therapies like we do in cancer to get effective therapy? Can we design our own synthetic enzymes that will be more effective? So let's talk about route of administration here first. And actually, this era of small molecule innovation becomes very important because unlike enzyme replacement, there are big, large molecules that cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, sometimes a very tiny, small molecule, like aspirin, like cocaine, like morphine, those molecules do go into the blood or the stomach, into the blood, and then get into the brain. So how can we do that with MPS conditions? Well, the first example of that is a drug called Miglostat, sold under the commercial name Zavesca. And that was used for Gaucher disease. And I'll say, it, I'll say at this point that it's approved for use of Gaucher disease, but now I'm going to talk about off-label use. That same molecule works in the metabolic pathway of the gangliosidosis, so Tay-Sachs disease, Sandhoff disease, GM2 gangliosidosis. And we at Minnesota have experimented with that off-label use of a small molecule to impact brain disease, and those data have been published. Pyrimethamine illustrates how NIH and uh, other pharmaceutical companies and company, uh, 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 pharmaceutical companies have, have done something very creative. If you've got a drug like pyrimethamine that is already approved for treating malaria of the brain, could you use it for some other purpose? Remember the FDA and the European version EMA first look at a drug in terms of its safety. And if a drug like pyrimethamine is already approved for some use, well, we know it ought to be safe pretty much for another use. It's the safety in a human being is pretty you know, straightforward. So the question becomes, could you use pyrimethamine, an anti-malaria drug, for lysosomal disease? In fact, it was proposed and studied that that, that a molecule could be used to some extent uh, for Tay-Sachs disease, particularly the late onset or more attenuated form of that. Miglostat is an oral medication approved in Europe uh, for name and pick disease type C, a brain disease. Uh, Eliglustat is an oral molecule uh, 
which is a small molecule that does not impact the brain so far as we know, then megalostat is a drug recently approved in Europe, not, not again for brain disease, I don't want to mislead you there, but it's a small molecule that replaces or is equivalent to, in many respects, the big large enzyme replacement therapy. And then for POMP disease, AT200 is in development, and adalurin, which was initially proposed, basically, for treatment of MPS1, uh, has been more uh, rigorously uh, looked at for things like cystic fibrosis, but it still may be a molecule that could have potential for those with stop codon mutations who have MPS1 and MPS2 and other um, lysosomal diseases. Again, a small oral molecule that has more potential uh, for, for crossing the blood-brain barrier. So how about looking at other ways of uh, approaching the unmet needs, such as combining therapies? Well, here's an MPS um, um, example of that that I, <laughs> is a particular favorite of mine. Um, this y young gentleman here, the one in the green shirt, is one of my patients. We did a bone marrow transplant on him almost 30 years ago for Maratola May syndrome. It was a great outcome. He had minimal graft versus host disease. He's fully engrafted from his sister, and he's grown up 20 or 30 years later. We thought it was a great outcome, right? Great bone marrow transplant procedure. But now, at age 20, 25, what does he think? Was the outcome great? He's got some residual skeletal disease. If you look at kids his age or young adults his age, he knows he's got short stature. But he came back to us after 20 years and said, hey, um, Dr. Jarnas, Dr. Whitley, there's this new thing out there called enzyme replacement therapy. Would that do me any good? So we, a we answered the question in the following way. I said, you know, we don't know, but, um, you know, maybe we could get a hint at that. He actually had a needle phobia. He did not want to get, you know, regular infusions. But we said, let's look at your urine gag. That's a very good indicator. It's a biomarker of whether or not adding enzyme replacement therapy on top of your existing enzyme replacement therapy or transplant would do any good. So historically, we looked back. Uh, he happens to be this uh, gentleman right here, Height et al. We published on his uh, cervical cord um, problems way back uh, after his transplant. We also looked in the literature at four other patients. So we have five patients right here. We looked at their urine mucopolysaccharides or their urine gags here. But we always have to put that in the context of normal. And the normal level of gag changes as you get older. It goes down, even without treatment. But anyway, putting all these patients together, the average pre-transplant urine gag for these individuals was almost 1,000% above normal. So what happened after transplant? Well, for each of these patients, we show the same numbers after transplant. And here we see that for this uh, gentleman, that here he was 911% above normal before transplant, but many years later, it was markedly reduced down to only 133% of the top end of normal for his age. So that's what we expect. Um, this, I'm sorry, this 133% is for everybody. But for him, what does it mean? Well, here's the experiment we proposed to him. He said, okay, I'll do it. Now you're, you're age 25, you had a stable bone marrow engraftment for 23, 24 years. Let's give you a single dose of ERT. You've had 20 years of, 20 plus years of engraftment. Your urine gag should be down. Let's start off by checking your urine gag now then giving it one shot of ERT and seeing what it does to your urine gag. I said to him, you know, I don't think this is really going to have any effect, but let's give it a shot. We'll find out. So here he is. Uh, the dotted line here is the normal range for a guy his age, in his early 20s. And because his transplant had been, if you will, successful, he had a durable engraftment, he was making a lot of enzyme in his white cells, he was just a tiny bit above normal. You know, before transplant, he was way, way above this number. But we got three levels, actually, so he had a baseline. One thing about urine gags, you, it's like blood, blood pressure. It's going to vary a little bit day to day. You gotta, if you want to get a baseline or know where you really stand, you've got to follow a trend. You, if you're going to get a baseline, you've got to get multiple levels. One uh, measurement is not going to be satisfactory. I preach this. I'm spending time on it because many people do not recognize this. Okay? So then we gave him one shot of ERT, a drug known as naglozyme. And we, actually, he went back home. I had to business go, go to a business meeting, but his urine gags were sent. And here's what happened over the following daily urine connection, collections. Well, I thought, oh, that looks kind of interesting, but, you know, is that just variation? Look at how much variation there is in the three baseline levels and how much it's gone down by. That ain't much. And maybe that's just a measurement here. Maybe that's not even an effect of the drug. But day after day, we kept getting urine gag measurements and see what happens. So this convinced me and him 
that enzyme replacement therapy was adding something to his existing bone marrow transplant. Now to this day, I don't know if that effect would be prolonged if he had more than one dose. I don't know if it was a different route of administration, IV enzyme versus bone marrow transplant that made the difference. I don't know if it was a quantitative thing because he got more enzyme was his urine gag down. I don't know how that affects his joints, but we're finding out. He actually came back now a couple years later and he's getting enzyme every week. And he texts me, hey, Dr. Willie, I'm getting my enzyme today. We're measuring his urine gag and pretty soon we'll find out the answer to some of those questions. So what about uh, other examples of combination therapy? Well, here are some. Perhaps the first was in 2008 when we were taking patients through bone marrow transplant and uh, Patty Dixon and uh, Paul Richard and uh, uh, some of my colleagues, whoops, I gotta go backwards here, started giving um, intrathecal enzyme in addition. Those studies are still underway. Uh, in 2012, my colleague Dean Jarness and I started adding that oral agent Miglistat plus a ketogenic diet of all things to patients with gangocytosis. And this was based on the fact that in mice, if you put a mouse with uh, Sandhoff disease on a ketogenic diet, it'll get threefold more of that oral medication into the brain where you need it for that particular disease. Uh, people have tried adding um, uh, enzyme replacement therapy after um, Martolome bone marrow transplant, uh, or actually ERT, I just showed you that example. Giving ID uh, hydrosulfatase uh, intrathecally is being studied now, and they could also be used in patients with transplant. And then ERT plus an oral medication, uh, Miglostat for Gaucher disease. We have a number of patients that are getting both oral um, Miglostat and uh, Gaucher enzyme. So that's what happens with cognitive, I'm sorry, with uh, combining therapies. We still have a lot to learn on it, but that's what we do know at this point in time. But how about San Filippo syndrome? Well, as I told you, we did the first bone marrow transplants for Hurler syndrome back in 1983. The first bone marrow transplant in the U.S. was done here September 16th, 1983. But what about other conditions? <clears throat> at that same time we were learning about Hurler syndrome, we said, well, gee, if it works for Hurler syndrome, and actually a patient with Maratolome syndrome, it ought to work for Hunter syndrome, for San Filippo syndrome, for Wolman disease, for infantile Gaucher disease. So. Patients with all those conditions underwent transplant. And unfortunately, the good experience we'd seen with Hurler syndrome was not really reproducible or replicated in some of those other conditions. And we don't know why to this day. Maybe it's dose, maybe it's something else. But one of our failures, if you will, are using bone marrow transplant in, in San Filippo syndrome. And this is uh, results from, uh, boy, that microphone makes a difference, sorry. Um, this is an example, these are the IQs, if you will, for uh, half a dozen patients or so that had bone marrow transplants for San Filippo syndrome. And all the procedure, the transplant itself was um, successful. The patient survived and was engrafted in these cases. Look what happened to the developmental quotient. It continued downward. So by and large, uh, patients uh, have not been getting bone marrow transplants for San Filippo syndrome. Whatever amount of enzyme we're giving via that route is apparently not success and is not adequate uh, to prevent the disease from progressing. However, look at the ages of these patients. Uh, they're fairly young, the youngest being uh, just under two and the older ones being four and five and six when they got their transplant. So what about engineering new molecules? Well, this is the era of synthetic enzyme replacement. We can, we can make our own enzymes, we can custom, custom design them to do the things we want to do, perhaps. So uh, um, uh, Armagen has a, has a pair of molecules, one for Hurler syndrome, one for Hunter syndrome, or I should say MPS1 and MPS2, uh, in development and in clinical trials. Uh, they've customized the, um, the enzyme, the normal human Hunter or Hurler enzyme, uh, by adding on um, an insulin molecule that's picked up by, the, uh, by the, uh, the insulin receptor on the cell surface. And this is a prominent receptor on, uh, on uh, nerve cells. Uh, in uh, phase three, Biomren is working on a glycosylation uh, independent uh, molecule uh, for POMP disease. And you can see here other um, drugs are being developed using the same approach. Uh, engineering or designing an enzyme that contains a variation that should make it uh, taken up by the uh, by the brain better. Here's one example of some stuff we've been doing in our lab. Uh, there's a company, BioStrategies, who came to us and said, do you guys know about that toxic molecule, ricin? You cannot own ricin in the U.S. It's considered a select reagent. It's illegal to have it. A drop of it in the Mississippi River could kill thousands of people. 
So the curious thing is, you can take apart uh, ricin into two components, uh, the, the, the dangerous end and the, and the safe end. And the safe end is called, uh, you can call it RTB. And if you link it to an enzyme like, um, uh, well, a lot of proteins to iduronidase, for example, it will get it into the, across the cell membrane better. So a company that was working with this said, can we use this RTB lectin to get enzyme across the blood brain barrier in mice that have MPS1? So we did some studies with them. They had done these studies in tissue culture. And uh, uh, I'm not going to show you the results of, of the mice yet because they're still uh, being uh, finalized for publication. But basically, by using this kind of synthetic approach, we can increase the transit of so a molecule like iduronidase across the blood-brain barrier and get an effect, get an efficacy across the blood-brain barrier. Well, here we are. Let's go to our, I think, final type of therapy and what I'm here for. Uh, in fact, the term gene therapy was first coined by Ted Friedman in the seminal paper in 1972. <clears throat> and um, he was describing uh, how he and his colleagues had discovered how to deliver healthy DNA in common parlance, to treat human diseases. In his case, using a virus or a viral vector to deliver that therapy to cells in the body. It was an amazing idea. I was very early in my career when this work was being done and I thought, my gosh, we can gene genetically engineer viruses to become vehicles or vectors for therapy. Thus the term uh, gene therapy was born, if you will, in 1972. So, so that begins the era of gene therapy. That's what it theoretically uh, was possible. But look, the first actual clinical trial for any human gene therapy was not done until 1990. That's quite a long ways, ways later. And many of you uh, know about that. French Anderson, Michael Blaze, uh, and, and, and Adon Cohen and his colleagues at NIH delivered the adenosine deaminase gene to three kids with that boy in the bubble disease. Remember the boy in the bubble, a child who had to be isolated because any kind of infection could be lethal for him. He had a very, very poor uh, immune system. But by replacing a single enzyme, adenosine deaminase, in his lymphocytes, he had normal immunity. He could get out of the bubble and survive. And I believe those children are still, still alive, uh, having undergone um, uh, various kinds of gene therapy, actually, uh, to reconstitute their immune system. Um, 1993, uh, uh, we had uh, Carlson and Behringer and Schoening, each of them trying to do the same thing with Gaucher disease. I'm showing you here the very early experiments and then focusing just on those for lysosomal conditions. If you look today, as I did this morning, at the NIH registry of gene therapy protocols that have been submitted to NIH, uh, it's a 500-page document, 500 pages. So there's been many, many attempts at various kinds of gene therapy. Look at these that have been proposed for lysosomal diseases, many of which have actually been done. If we go down the list, the first three were for Gaucher disease. I did one for Hunter syndrome, as uh, Mark uh, mentioned. Uh, Ron Crystal in New York has been working very, very hard and works today very, very hard on Batten disease, galactosialidosis, um, and then others using uh, related but not lysosomal conditions, excellent leukodystrophy, metachromatic leukodystrophy. And we'll talk a few uh, minutes more about attempts at San Filippo syndrome and MPS1 and MPS2 gene therapy and how that work is going in the current era. So um, let's focus particularly on San Filippo syndrome, uh, one of the early ones trying to go after that problem of the blood-brain barrier uh, was done uh, um, by uh, Mark Tadieu and Lysogene. Um, and they, they gave um, uh, the vector directly to the brain, so they're mechanically getting across the blood-brain barrier by drilling some little bur what we call burr holes in the skull using a very, very small needle, injecting it into the parenchyma of the brain tissue itself, and seeing if an AEV virus, a, a, a non-reproducing uh, virus, uh, could, could put the gene into enough cells and make enough enzyme to prevent the brain disease. And those first four children had, if you will, these uh, safety indicators here, good tolerance, neurosurgery uh, itself was uneventful. The absence of adverse effects was, was good. They did not have a lot of bleeding into the brain or anything that might be a, considered a safety issue. And so, as you've heard um, at this meeting earlier, uh, that kind of approach is uh, continuing on. In fact, here's some slides, the lysogene that Sam Parker has provided for me, but I think if you want to know more about this, you could talk about it more directly with her. But an overall examining or that, 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 that view uh, is something that continues on. Uh, direct to brain therapy, where structurally uh, 
you're disrupting the blood-brain barrier or using a needle to get something across the blood-brain barrier instead of a chemical modification. Um, so it first was done in Europe, and I think they're trying to come to the U.S. here very, uh, very soon. And this shows some enzyme activity in the brain in some of their studies. Um, I'm not going to do this. Uh, I might be forced to do this study. Once you get this movie going, you can't stop it. <laughs> but if, as you know, in San Filippo, said, well, how, do you measure the, uh, how do you measure the outcome in a mouse? Well, we, we think of hyperactivity being a key feature of San Filippo syndrome. So this is one of those things we can do in a laboratory. Uh, basically put a camera above a mouse cage and look at the three different groups here and then quantify actually the amount of running around that a mouse does. And a mouse who doesn't recognize his or her environment and is constantly moving will essentially be the hyperactive person. Um, in, that's the mouse version of it. So you can quantify that, come up with these data here in this graph that shows that untreated San Filippo mice are much more hyperactive, if you will, but you can uh, re reduce that by this test uh, by doing this kind of gene therapy. So back to the list, um, let's look at uh, other things. Um, a Regenix Bio has been working on MPS1. Many of you know Jim Wilson did, did some of the first uh, gene therapy. He has developed a whole cadre of variant AAV vectors, ones that are, are probably better at getting it at the liver or the central nervous system. And in fact, one of his ideas and now being implemented by Regenix Bio is to use um, an AEV9 vector and again delivering it by a minor surgery, meaning a spinal tap of sorts. Uh, and the, the proposal he's showing is here that uh, we call intrathecal the process of uh, basically using a needle or a tube to, to get around the blood brain barrier by inserting something directly into, into spinal fluid. When we do a lumbar type, a spinal tap, that's what we're doing. When we inject up here, just where the neck and the skull at, uh, are attached, uh, there's a relatively safe spot there in some respects. We don't have to go through brain tissue. We have other concerns. There's a lot of blood vessels right there, which make this a little bit different, and that has to be all worked out. But uh, Jim uh, Wilson and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have shown that this intracisternal delivery in mice is getting more enzyme to the brain than if you do a spinal tap, so they're choosing um, this area. <coughs> Pardon me, and they're very interested in taking this on to human therapy. Um, another area to look at um, is uh, what's been done by, uh, by Sangamo here, and we're collaborators in this. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something that you heard maybe last night about zinc finger nuclease uh, gene editing. Gene editing is perhaps one of the newest forms in some ways of gene therapy. As uh, uh, Sagar Veja, uh, pointed out last night, zinc finger nucleases, or zinc fingers at least, were discovered uh, two decades ago. And so uh, the founders of Sangamo and its predecessors uh, understood the biology. You can design a molecule that will bind right here on the DNA and then right here next to it, kind of a GPS approach that even though there may be 300 billion nucleotides in the human genome, you can design a zinc finger that goes just to one place and not any place else. That's the beauty. And if you attach what are called nucleases, you can actually use uh, one GPS-directed zinc finger nuclease to cut the DNA right there, let's just say in the albumin gene, and then another one right next to it, have it cut the DNA, and then insert the gene of interest or the therapeutic gene right in the middle. So um, Sangamo asked us three years ago to investigate that in actual MPS1 disease. They designed all the, the vectors. Uh, my colleagues at the University of Minnesota and I, and our collaborators like Russ DeKelver, who are here uh, in the audience today too, uh, started testing this in MPS1 mice, uh, the MPS1 mice in my lab, and uh, Scott McIver's back here did the work in the MPS2 mice. Um, we were starting with this underlying calculation. How much enzyme would, would a virus have to make, let's say in the liver, in the albumin gene, to be equivalent to giving you know, intravenous loronidase injections? And so we can kind of make the calculation here. Um, my colleagues at Sangamo made this, but it makes sense. If you give an ERT dose at the usual dose of 0.58 milligrams per kilogram, and you give it to an average person, we in medicine talk about the average person being about 70 kilograms, then for MPS1, IV therapy is 43.5 milligrams. That's how much you would have to make in the liver by gene therapy to be equivalent to getting a weekly loronidase dose. And you look at the half-life, and that's kind of relevant, but irrelevant at this moment. So 
if instead we told the liver's albumin gene to make liranidase using zinc finger nuclease gene editing, how many cells would you have to transduce or correct or edit to get the equivalent amount of enzyme? Well, 0.05%, not 1%, not 0.5%. Not, but 0.05%, that is a minute number of cells you'd have to edit, trick them into making liranidase, if you will, instead of um, albumin, because the body, the liver, makes so much albumin. Hum albumin is a very important protein, but we make tons of it every single minute, every single day. And if you can just trick a few cells or edit them to make liranidase or alpha lidronidase instead of albumin, you know, you're going to get roughly an equivalent dose of liranidase. And Mark Dent is waving hi to me. Hi, Mark. <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> OK. Uh, so anyway, how does that work? And I, th I think we're going to be well-timed here, just to give you some reassurance. Um, here's the molecular biology. Here's the diagram. Here's the cartoon, as they say. Here's the left cutter zinc finger nucleus. It grabs onto the DPA, uh, the, the, the DNA, by virtue of its, of its GPS system. That's the left cutting zinc finger nuclease. And then the other one over here, the right one, has this, uh, this, this GPA system. It's kind of like, um, uh, uh, I think of it as a Google you know, find command. You say, here's the, here's the, here's the thing I want to find here. This is the, you know, if I want to find out Minneapolis, I type in M-I-N-N-E-A-P-O-L-S. Well, by injecting this vector into a cell or into, a, into the blood and getting it into the the cell, it goes looking for, for Minneapolis on the DNA, the, the genome. So bingo, that's where it finds, that's Minneapolis right there. Putting these two together, these two cutter molecules, these scissors, are right next to each other, right where you want them. They cut the DNA, and you put a third virus in there that's carrying the normal hurler gene. And you slam it, slip it right in there. And then, this happens to be the albumin gene, you're splitting it, so you lose that little tiny bit of albumin, no big deal. And this has all been calculated out. You're not going to miss a tiny drop of albumin. But if you can make that one albumin gene start making alpha hydronidase, you're making a ton of enzyme. And you're making it not just once a week. You're making it every day, every minute, every second. It's a continuous infusion, just like your body normally does if you have normal alpha hydronidase. So how does that work in the mice? I'm not going to spend a long time because I only have that much left or less. Okay, so to, to, to make a long story short, if you look at the liver, you get a ton of enzyme. If you look at the, the blood, the plasma, you get a ton of enzyme. You have to worry about it going down here in a short-term experience experiment, but we get around that. You look at the spleen, the liver, the lung, you get a lot of enzyme. Furthermore, if you look at the gag, the stuff you want to get rid of, well, look at the mouse. This is all mice, by the way. Look at the mouse gag. It goes down with treatment. If you look at the tissue gag, out at uh, 60 days, two months later, it goes down the way it should. If you look at enzyme over a longer period of time, out to 120 days, you see enzyme that is going on and on and on for 120 days. It looks like it is what we in the business call stable expression. It's not a transient temporary effect. Perhaps it's lifelong. That's the goal. A single treatment could be making enzyme lifelong. So. There's your gag levels untreated up on top. Mice that did not get treatment. You see, there's a lot of variation. This is what I want you to take home. Remember, one gag level every year is not going to tell you the story. You've got to get a trend. So get a gag level if you're getting some kind of treatment every single month or at some regular interval. But anyway, look at what the mice do. They get down, they stay down. Um, if we look at um, uh, enzyme in various organs, if you could had time to drill down this, and this will be published pretty soon, we hope. You get consistent low levels of GAG and high levels of enzyme. There's the GAG. You can see it microscopically. These cells in the untreated mice, um, MPS1 mice, have lots of foamy stuff. That's the bad GAG in those cells. If you look at the, the treated mice over here, it's on. It's gone. This hole here is just a blood vessel. But if you look very carefully under the microscope, you don't see all the GAG there in that, uh, in that uh, lymph node. Uh, so it works in males in terms of behavior even. Uh, the green is the good. Uh, untreated mice are the bad ones. They don't learn. The ones that are treated are good. And so I guess I'm running out of time. Thank you very much, Mark.